turns out, as we point with what he said, we are not going to really be able to uh, run the. Uh, this probably actually here, and it, which is a different kind of a story. This is why we're supposed to kind of speed up things. Uh, but even doing more in the chip is becoming problematic, again, because of that leakage and the end of the NARS, you know, scaling. So this is actually here, as we have been progressing, uh, this is like the feature size, how, you know, kind of fine I can have my transistors and things here uh, on my chip. Uh, and there has been a lot of stuff that's in the 10 nanometer range. I think, you know, if you have an iPhone, or the chances are your chip is in that range or something like that. Uh, then a lot of people said that beyond seven nanometers, we cannot go lower than that. That at that point of time, uh, your circuitry, your transistor will function as a wire. It's no longer going to be a transistor. But we started to see actually here that we're able to get down to that level. And actually, in fact, Intel is delivering and will be delivering uh, for the next uh, kind of generation of supercomputers uh, is going to be delivering a bunch of chips that are all uh, at seven nanometers. And then IBM has announced a five nanometer uh, and, and so on and so forth. So in, in, in actually summary, what is happening here is that we're having difficulty making that kind of, uh, if you will, feature size smaller, but designers are very clever and they can still pull a bunch uh, of, of more or less like tricks out of their sleeve. And that probably will continue to get us to go through some additional generations of improvements, but we are not gonna probably actually continue to be able to do that. And eventually we're gonna be stuck. So uh, because of that, people are saying, what should we do here in the long range? We should look for innovations that will not necessarily come from speed from the chip, from actually it's not going to work for us. Like finding new architectures, like getting a new architecture, for instance, uh, that would be inspired by the brain, maybe, okay? Or perhaps looking for new devices, or doing quantum computing, or robotics, or a combination of all of this. But uh, it is actually clear to us that probably actually here down the road, uh, we're going to be seeing, uh, we're going to be getting to a point of time uh, at which we're no longer being able to, you know, just do business as usual, and we're going to have to rely more in some of these types uh, of new innovation. Story about where we stand right now, okay? <coughs> and take a look at the supercomputers, the top ones in the world, and, you know, the sophistication in them, how fast they are, and so on and so forth. So looking at those considerations here, it turns out that supercomputers get assessed twice a year. So every six months, once in November, and then once again in June, we'll make an assessment and look what are the top 500 computers in the world. Okay, so in fact, you can always go and visit <coughs> top500.org, and it will tell you right now what is the top list. It will give you a lot of the characteristics of that list, okay? So the last list then happened when? Happened last November. Okay, so in November, this list is announced in the supercomputing conference in the US, but in June, it is announced in Germany in the International Supercomputing Conference. So the last time it was actually ever announced here, it was actually November 2019. And if we look at that, we're gonna see, for example, two supercomputers here from the top that are in the US. So these are Summit and Sierra. And you can quite look at the composition. These are both are in labs that are owned by the Department of Energy. So they do a lot of things that are, uh, you know, uh, very sophisticated, uh, from simulating nuclear explosions to many other weather phenomena to a lot of different types of sciences. So if we look, if we look at these two machines here, number one, you're gonna see that the two of them are using actually in addition to the regular microprocessor, so the microprocessor that they are using, both of them, are IBM, uh, you know, kind of power microprocessors, okay? But you can see that both of them, in order to assist this kind of microprocessor go very far in terms of computations, they are adding to it NVIDIA GPUs, all right? So the NVIDIA GPUs are extremely, very strong number of crunchers, and basically, actually, they have tons of these simplified cores, so they can get, actually, very high ratio of performance to power consumed, all right? And, and that really actually here give you the first impression that, well, it probably means that we're really also stuck in a sense, because it does show you that here in order to get the speed and keep the power low, all right? So we're resorting 
to actually to the to the graphical processing units to help us with that. So that's actually number uh, uh, <coughs> one of the observing. And by the way, the speeds that you can see here, you can see actually the top one having 148 teraflops. So a teraflop is actually uh, a thousand teraflop, and a tera is a trillion. So that's actually is like a thousand trillion, 148 thousand trillion calculation per second, if you want to make sense out of that, okay? Uh, you also need to realize that these calculations in this case here are all double precision floating point, all right? Uh, and uh, they are of concern to people that are doing computation. We are in a world where growingly we are more interested right now, or at equally interested at least, as number of inferences per second. We are also interested in how much data processing we're going to be doing per second because of that data volumes and AI and the like, okay? So this is fine, okay? I think the part that is not fine, uh, and actually you can look at the number of cores, that also will give you the level of sophistication. Uh, that's actually like about two and a half million cores. So that's a very, very complex machine, all right? Uh, and then you look at the amount of power that's being consumed, and that small M is supposed to be big M. It's actually 10.1 megawatt, okay? So that's the that's, that probably is a big enough uh, amount of power for a small city, actually, okay? And in order to run uh, here in the U.S., just for the electric bill. I'm going to jump down and go to number three, which is actually in China. And that used to be number one before, okay? It has really actually like regular types of cores, if you will. They probably are simpler. They don't do like out-of-order computations or something like that. But look at how many cores it does have. It has actually 10 and a half million cores. Okay, so that's again, it's really crazy. It tells you that we're really actually here uh, hitting some kind of a, of a dead end. And if you look at the amount of power, it's 3.4 megawatts. So, so this kind of really, really complex, very expensive, all right? We have, we are consuming a lot of power, all right? So we really, that all of that kind of shows you we really need differently because we are approaching that limit. So this is all assist with the beta flops. Anybody knows what's after the beta flops? What would be the next level? It's always a thousand fold. All right, so it was tera, then it became beta, then the next level is exa. All right, so exa will be a million trillion calculation per second. We are expecting to see the first exa machine deployed in the US next year, 2021. Right now, this <coughs> next machine, the 2021 EXA machine, will be done using the standard CMOS technology and things like that. But everybody in that community says that it would be impossible to go to the following 1,000 fold using the same technology <coughs> that we have used. So that's actually how the real it is. So we came from the Giga to the Tera to the Tera, okay, to the EXA using the same CMOS technology. There's no way we're going to make it from the EXA to the next level, which is the data, okay, at all, using the technology that we have. We have to have new technology, okay? So any questions so far? All right, so I hope at least we have actually kind of, uh, you can also see uh, why a lot of countries here are actually jumping and trying to compete, all right? And it's basically actually because uh, supercomputing is not just about supercomputing, number one, Products, you'll be able to do a lot of efficient products, design, plane, whatever. But more importantly, the supercomputing or the supercomputer of today becomes more or less the conventional computer tomorrow. Okay, so it's always like that. Okay, so whatever innovations we have today, the more we figure out a way to make them smaller and fit them into a chip or into a board or something like that. And I can show you lots of examples where basically actually like one chip, like a, a, a late 2000, uh, a chip would run probably something like about seven uh, teraflops would be like the top one in the world, the top machine in the world. Okay, right now, a GPU would actually would beat that, you know, up with a single chip or something like that, okay? So, uh, <coughs> anyway, I, but that actually we are not we're used to that. We're used to figuring out here that we had at least to change the architecture as we have been going through actually our path. So we started with vector machines in the early 80s or something like that. Then later on in the 90s, we started to put a lot of commercial off-the-shelf microprocessors together 
and hook them up with a very sophisticated network, okay? Uh, then later on, we started to see things like GPU accelerators, gaming accelerators, and this is how we're able to get into the beta flop world, okay? In fact, the first machine to get into the beta flop was a machine that was built using the same processor that we were using in the PlayStation 3, okay? So that's actually how we've been able to achieve all these kinds of things. Well, I mean, so we are obviously having a problem with the computing, and this is happening in the long time because there's a huge demand. So think about something <coughs> like a self-driving car, okay? If you have a self-driving car, what goes on that self-driving car to be able to drive itself away from the computing. Let's even not worry about the computing yet for a second. But let's look at the amount of data that we're gonna need to bring into those computations and those decisions, okay? So how many sensors do you have? You have a radar, it brings anywhere between 10 to 100 kilobytes per second. It does have cameras, it would bring you anywhere between 20 to 40 megabytes per second. Uh, it does have, uh, you know, actually like, you know, uh, many other things, a LiDAR, a GPS, Sonar, a lot of different things. So in total, you would be getting something like about four seven or actually like four terabytes a day that you know need to be processed and decisions need to be made by that self-driving vehicle. This is actually here is the Intel Go Kart, which is actually the Intel uh, version of that you know kind of project. Okay, and obviously it's not about one car. I mean, you want to actually to have one that project in a big. Uh, city like Delhi or something like that, you need to imagine how many cars, how much data, things of that sort that really actually become uh, very mind boggling. Uh, these are some of the applications that we're starting to see, and I'm, I'm really giving you here applications of our scientific side and the, you know, the, the, the high tech side, but there are many other things, you know, that even if you are just walking in a store and you need recommendations and things like that, there's so much real time processing and data that need to be ingested. But this is here is another project. It's called the Kilometer Square Array. <coughs> this is actually here uh, is, a, is a telescope. So it's like a deep space telescope. Uh, this is supposed to detect uh, radio signals from billions of light years away to kind of look for extraterrestrial life and things of that sort. Uh, this one here is, in, is they're working on it. 2024, it will be deployed. It would be partly in Australia and then partly in South Africa. And they are looking at about 10 beta pipes per day compressed. So of course, if they are not compressed, they are looking at a lot more. So this is the kind of stuff that you need to go ahead and process, okay? So that's again, is a crazy thing. All right, so without really giving you more examples about that kind of challenges, you, you probably understand them even, uh, again, as I was like saying, if you are just, uh, trying to work, walk in a smart city, in a smart store, or something like that. There, there are tons of things here that we can think of that would be consuming a lot of data and requiring lots of, uh, you know, real time computation. So one of the ideas that we are looking at here, or people are looking at, is the so-called uh, memristors, or analog computing in general, trying to go uh, far from, again, from the, uh, uh, from actually the digital, uh, you know, computing, and trying to go to the analog uh, computing and in particular, uh, there's something people that are looking at for this particular instant device that they were able to define, which is called the memristor. It's essentially a resistance that memorizes the current that passes through it. Okay, and uh, you know uh, the, the way they actually discovered that this is uh, something that maybe it should exist because we never thought of that you know before uh, was essentially that in in the elect electrical uh, you know, kind of area, uh, you're gonna find that there are voltages, there are currents, there are fluxes, and then there are charges. And then they count that, you know, okay, if I look at the voltage and the current, they are actually related to each other by components, which is the resistance. Uh, if I'm looking at something like the currents here, uh, uh, and, the, and the actually the flux, they are actually interrelated by something that we call the conductance, and then in terms of actually the charge and the voltage, they are interrelated by the capacitance. But there was nothing whatsoever in that kind of lower right quadrant in there. There was nothing there to relate, uh, you know, the charge with the flux. So the scientists actually worked on it and they came up with that, you know, kind of device. And they found out that it can actually help in many things. An example of that here 
is a so-called, uh, is, is actually, uh, that meme register here uh, is actually kind of a network of those meme registers uh, that you could really use like that, uh, and you could use that simply for uh, kind of matrix to vector multiplication. That's a computation that you would need a lot if you are doing uh, you know, uh, machine learning. Many, many applications actually would require that, linear algebra and the like, and you could just actually be presenting here uh, the vector as a set of voltages, also the matrix as a set of voltages, and essentially as they flow, these resistances would remember what has passed through, and this, is, this gets integrated, and you are producing at the end here in one shot. Uh, you know, this actually kind of uh, results of, uh, you know, actually the matrix to vector, you know, multiplication, for example. So that's really one of the ideas that people are looking at. Uh, photonic computing, and uh, I'd say until a few years back, I had no idea what that is, what, what uh, photonics and things of that sort. And when this whole uh, area of post Bohr's law kind of processors started to, you know, to become very important area, and the US government started to have computations for people to come up with innovative processors, then uh, I have a friend who actually does a lot of photonics work, and he is in the, his background is physics, basically, okay? So we started to sit down and talk to each other about what sort of things we can do. So I'm gonna show you a few of the things here uh, that really represent a number of ongoing projects, all of which are funded by the government. They are multi-year things right now. We have a number of patents, a number of actually, uh, of even of, uh, of big, large, uh, you know, actually projects and grants, and we created a small company to look at that, you know, kind of direction as well here. Uh, but it's actually among the areas of maybe where we can look, you know, kind of next year. It has a lot of, of kind of interesting features that, uh, it, unlike the Van Neumann model here, it's just actually like a, a one kind of a shot type of an exclusion. So the lights will flow, or the lasers will, will send them the light through a bunch of devices, from the other side, you're gonna get the answers. Unlike the uh, digital kind of, of, of behavior, which requires, again, the Van Neumann model and the iteration sometimes, if I'm solving, uh, you know, something like, if we were solving actually, for example, the vector to matrix multiplication, before I did show you that, you would go through the Jacobi or whatever, and, and all of that would require a lot of iterations and things of that sort. Uh, it, it does actually have uh, amazing features with respect to power consumption, it works in that attojoule range, so you're talking about 10 to minus 18 or something like that, which is really extremely low, okay? And it is actually intrinsically reconfigurable. I could really play with the material to make it react to the light in a variety of ways, okay? And I'll show you an example of that. And so on and so forth. I could actually here send the light using many different wavelengths and get a lot of parallelism, okay? They do not interfere with one another when they go into a, into a waveguide, unlike if I send, uh, you know, if I send like, uh, you know, a, a, a kind of electric signals, I probably have to do like a lot of modulation, but you know, things would be really not that easy to do, uh, you know, with them, things of that nature. So it has a lot of very nice, uh, you know, features, and we try to bring our two groups, my group that looks uh, more at the high performance computing <coughs> architecture and distributed structure, <coughs> and a group that looks more at the level of photonics, and we started really actually to come up with a bunch of ideas. There are lots of ideas that we came up with. We cannot come up with one particular computer, actually, compute engine. But we came up with a bunch, okay? We came up with a few, each of which can do a different thing, okay? So, for example, uh, one of the ones that we found that was very interesting here uh, was the so-called rock project that we have. And we have a patent now for that. We have you know, some papers uh, coming out from the ACM transactions on the like. Uh, so this is here is the first one. Uh, it's basically a reconfigurable computer that can solve partial differential equations, which people use for simulating anything. If I'm trying to simulate the weather, if I'm trying to simulate uh, you know, heat transfer, if I'm trying to simulate anything uh, in, in, uh, you know, in physics uh, or engineering, uh, you would need a partial differential equation. Uh, we are also trying to use those here to build uh, what we call neuromorphic processors that are inspired by how the brain operates, okay? And we have a joint project uh, for that. So the first one project is actually supported by the National Science Foundation. Uh, the second one is a combination of the Science Down Sci National Science Foundation and the Semiconductor Research Consortium. And it's a joint work between Austin GW and Princeton 
a university. And then the third one, there is a new arithmetic, which is a totally different kind of arithmetic. It's a Chinese arithmetic kind of a thing here. And you use it for doing all the computations and stuff like that, which is actually much simpler than what it sounds. Uh, that, that's that third one here is funded by the by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research. Okay, and we do not just want to kind of you know, create those little devices that we compute. We're trying to look if we can really create an end-to-end -end system, a complete architecture. Uh, then also try to really actually look for the software programmability and all of these types of issues. Okay, uh, I guess I'm going to just uh, for the interest of time jump to the first one. So the first one is the reconfigurable optical processor. I, I talked about this being here something that can solve partial differential equations. Okay. Imagine that you have this thing here on the upper right, which is actually like a piece of metal, for example. Okay, it's a sheet of metal. And then the yellow thing here, okay, is something like you know, you introduce some form of heat. So you heated that part. And then you would like to study how that heat would transfer and it starts to diffuse into this whole structure or something like that. That's something very important that we have used in problems uh, like new ways of manufacturing cement. People are using it in fuel cells in any case, okay? Uh, and essentially what people would do is that you would describe, you would describe this thing here using what we call partial differential equation that follows this kind of pattern here, which is the Mosai equation, for example, okay? And then we take this formulation here and we try to discretize it, all right? So we basically actually come to every point in the, and unfortunately this is not uh, pointing you know, well here, but, but you come to every point, like, so basically you come, <coughs> you take the whole thing here and you break it into like a grid, okay, with cells. And this is like here, four cells next to each other. And then in the center here, I'm looking at the, and the, uh, at the inner cell, and then I try to sort of really figure out the differences in temperature, add them up, and you know, basically actually sort of get the average, and then produce the next time step, for example. All right? Uh, so, so to do that, uh, basically actually I need to take into account uh, that conductance or distance, if you will, between <coughs> that center point and between the points around it, more or less. All right? Uh, and you create that no difference if we get the temperature Hello? and all of my neighbors. Hello? Okay, from take the difference, divide that by the square of this conductance value or that distance value or something of that sort. So this is temperature, temperature. All of these keys are temperature. Now, you know, all of these issues are those conductances or something like that, okay, uh, for that, you know, heat. And it turns out that I can take Name all of this here and replace it with electrical quantities. So I could replace those keys or those temperatures <coughs> with voltages, and I could you know, change those conductances with actually with resistances. And then what I have is essentially an electric, uh, is a network or a mesh of electric components. In this case, it would be resistances, for example. All right? But I could also have other types of components, and I could represent different styles of partial differential equations that solve different problems in science and engineering. Okay, and here, you are basically actually doing this solution right out of the first principle. You are basically taking the problem and mapping it directly here into components that can solve it uh, in, in direct chunks, okay? Uh, so that really is, is the thing. So essentially, if I'm using you know, resistances and the like and creating a chip with those kind of networks, of resistances and things of that sort, like that network, if you will, and you see that one here on the upper right, that network of resistances, then, you know, we're still consuming also power and things of that sort. So the idea was, can I replace the electric current with a laser, for example? That would be very low power <coughs> laser. Can I really actually use those kind of nanophotonic components? Am I gonna be able to find some material that would act like resistances and capacitances and things like that, all right? So the researching this particular area, we found actually that if I am to apply the, the laser as a current and I'm pushing that you know, through, I can find material that would work. I can bias that material and it will work for me like a resistance and the like. One particular material that we found is something that people create from scratch, some we found in nature, so because of that, we call it a nature material, all right? It's actually called uh, a titanium uh, 
uh, export will actually end the end of the cycle. So this is like a, a characteristic curve here. And depending upon the bias that you're going to apply to that material and which point you're going to select in the curve, you're going to be getting actually something that operates like a capacitance, like an inductance, uh, or you know, like a resistance. Okay, so you could use those uh, to produce that reconfigurable uh, you know, optical uh, computer, uh, which actually, at the end of the day, this is actually the upper. So, so this is like the resistance that you will, uh, you know, kind of a uh, or, or mesh that you have. This is actually how we emulate it on the upper right with those little squares. Those squares are pieces of that material that we call them optical elements that I can bias them to work again as one of those kinds of elements. Okay, that way I'm getting to that, you know, kind of attitude level of energy and the like. Okay? So uh, this is an ongoing project. Uh, the, the, the prospects that we're seeing here is that we would be able to achieve hopefully orders of magnitude improvement uh, when you look at the uh, speed, so we are getting here the speed of light, okay, and uh, the energy, and, and the key problem that we have with that is that in order to control that, you need electronic components, okay? So those are establishing more or less some kind of to the extent possible, okay? Uh, the uh, neuromorphic uh, computing, so uh, basically, uh, we're gonna we're gonna take a couple of looks at that. The first time I'm looking at it here is maybe even the harsher one. I'm looking basically here at it for the purpose of the nanophotonic implementation here. Okay, so uh, essentially your brain has all of these little things that are called neurons. Okay, and those neurons are connected to one another, right? Okay, uh, and these are called synaptic connections, basically between those neurons. I'll talk to you uh, again on that you know, later on. Okay. Uh, and then basically you are getting all of these here, and you are getting them into a single neuron, and uh, you know, as inputs, they are being weighted, okay, then summed up, all right, and then they go to an activation function that make a decision, okay, just like the way you would work uh, with artificial neural networks or something like that, of course, here. So how do you do that here uh, in terms of optics? Uh, so uh, in this case, what is happening here is that each one of those colors is representing one particular neuron, all right? Uh, and then they are all, the, all of these little kind of rings with those different colors are connected to that ring. So that ring is providing those synaptic connections. All of these different neurons can send different wavelengths over the same ring, same actually optical kind of guide, all right, waveguide, and it can actually happen simultaneously, right? But then, you know, each color can tune and grab those. So each one of those structures here corresponds to one neuron, okay? So basically it can be tuned to grab from the other neurons that are uh, in, in, in the represented by the other you know, colors. Uh, there's a little bit here of a photodetector that looks a little bit like a diode. This one here is gonna basically sum up all of these kind of towers together, all right? So basically you have, you float things around, there is some tuning and that tuning can work also uh, as a weighting function as well, okay? So it can actually scale the amount of power up and down, things that are actually not up and down, okay? Uh, and then basically I sum them up, I get that kind of, of photo detector to, to do that summation for me, and then activation function, and then basically I pass them on uh, to, the, to the ring again one more time, okay? Um, this is uh, another, uh, you know, uh, computing paradigm also that we came up with at that project is funded again by the Air Force, as I was actually saying here. And uh, essentially, this one is using something called residual number arithmetic. This is like a kind of a, a, a module arithmetic that's kind of based on a Chinese system, you know, more or less, uh, for uh, for actually for, for computing. All right, so uh, uh, the thing is, it can be actually implemented more or less because it's a modular arithmetic. I can actually use switches and I can shift the signal on the switch to do a modulo kind of an operation, all right? So, uh, for example, uh, I'm not even really showing this here. So, so, so I could basically actually like, you know, represent a number uh, by taking, I can take that number and I can think of a number of moduli uh, that I'll be using to represent that number, all right? And then basically actually will take that number and these moduli need to be primed with respect to one another. None of them is dividing the other one. Okay? 
and then you take the number of them you actually want to represent, and then you start running it through those moduli and coming with a representation. Unfortunately, from here, I cannot see what's on, on the screen uh, like this, but for example, the number 64, okay, if I'm trying to represent it using this kind of set of moduli, 13, 10, and uh, I cannot see the other one here, 13, 16, and 10, or something like that, okay, then essentially to produce those kind of, of actually of, of representation here, uh, the 12, the 0, and the 70, all right? So, uh, and you can notice here, because it's 64, then the 16 divided evenly, so I end up with the 0, because actually the remainder would be 0. So I'm just getting the remainders into the representation here, okay? Um, and then, so that would be the representation of this particular number, and then if I'm trying to add two numbers, that way. The good thing here is that if this is like S or the other digits, there are no carries or anything like that, that was like what happened in the digital system. Because there are no carries, then the processing becomes very much parallel in this particular case. Okay? Uh, if I need to do uh, addition, for example, so suppose I'd like to do a module by addition. So if I'm adding the input number to zero, everything comes through the switch. Okay? And just pass it through. If I need to add one, things will be shifted by one. If I need to add two, things will get shifted by two. So it's very simple kind of processes that are done using a bunch of switches to be representing those kind of computations, okay? And one of the great uh, you know, benefits is that here also you can blend the communication with the computation. So you don't have to do, you know, actually send and then compute and things of that sort. You can do the two uh, you know, simultaneously and things of that sort. There are many different adders that were designed using these kind of things. There, there's a paper uh, that we have in a conference called the IEEE Rebooting Computing Conference last November, where we actually compared a large number of these different types of adders actually here. There are other people, other researchers that have their own adders and have shown that ours do, you know, better and use less components and things of that sort. So I'm not going to be surprised spend the time here on that, okay? Forget now the photonics, so we look at something else. So neuromorphic again, but now not neuromorphic and photonic, neuromorphic in general. That's a big thing where essentially you find IBM and tell everybody is trying to develop neuromorphic processors. They work extremely well for classifications and things of like that. So, why neuromorphic? Because basically it kind of tries to get inspired by the brain. Why do we need to get inspired by the brain? Because the brain actually is a very complex computing machine that has tremendous efficiencies that we can never think of. So I told you about those little neurons that you have in your brain. So how many do we have in the human brain? We actually have a billion neurons, okay? Those neurons are connected to one another. So every neuron is connected to how many? connected to 10,000 on the average, you know, other, other neurons, okay? So when you think about that, then you have 100 trillion actually connections inside of your brain, all right? Now, remember the machines, the supercomputer that I was talking to you about, and we said how much power they were consuming. Remember the one that was 18 megawatts. How much does the brain consume? It only consumes about 20 watts, okay? So that's a huge difference. So because of that, we're trying to see, can we really try to learn from the brain? And I'm gonna actually try to very much uh, jump in our quickly over that, but there are so many things that we could do in this context. You can create a chip that would be actually inspired uh, by the brain. I'll, I'll probably show you a few of these here quickly, but <coughs> you don't have to do it. You can also do other things. Some people develop machines, all right? So Spinnaker is one of them, for example. Okay, that, that's actually built. <laughs> Uh, in Manchester, uh, and it's using ARM processors, but they have a big network that connects the processors together that can support fighting as what happens inside of your brain, for example, okay? And it can support a large number of synaptic connections and things like that. So, but you can also go and take a simulator of the brain and put it in a very fast <coughs> machine. And this is what this kind of other group of people are doing. This is a European brain project uh, where actually we are doing that. Uh, for the brain inspired actually chips in here, so there are many actually that are out there. There's actually a, an example would be the Funos 
is a very famous one, uh, historically, from actually IBM. Uh, and there's also the HRL, that's another one. But the one that is really right now is available, and it's an ongoing program inside of Intel, is Luigi. So Luigi actually is the name of the chip that Intel does have, you know, right now, and it is actually used, uh, you know, kind of a long term. Okay, so uh, just to get an idea here how these chips are like, you'll find that these chips are created again to have that simple kind of processor that can work as a neuron, uh, but then you would have a very large number of potential synaptic connections that can take us out of that, uh, you know, to the rest and things of that sort. You would need to be supporting, you would need to have low power, you need to be able to support spiking, you know, for example, in order to do one of those. Typically, something like that would be good for recognition, you know, speech, you know, speech recognition, uh, you know, uh, image recognition, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, this is here through North uh, uh, from IBM, and this is HRL. There's actually an article that you can go and search for, uh, 2014, and the actually spec from, you can actually learn a lot more about that from here. Okay, so Luigi, same thing. This is actually the one from Intel. They're using it for the linear adaptive control, and they're using robotics, um, and actually the like. Uh, 128,000 uh, neurons that a chip would have, and then each one of those chips can actually span out into 128 million synaptic innovation connections. Uh, and then the rest of the statistics you know, actually here. It's not when, when Neumann, obviously, it is actually something that needs to be uh, like, uh, you know, uh, a new network. You can look at some of the, in this paper here that Intel had, they were comparing the performance of Luigi to some of the GPU. And it turns out that Luigi actually here kind of beats up the GPU and all of the metrics, uh, except like when we started to batch for the learning and things like that, we started to batch actually and provide 64 batches and the GPU works better, but the GPU consumes a huge amount of, uh, you know, of power as compared to this particular chip, for example, okay? But on, on the rest of the metrics, the key is up, and I'm trying to go, you know, quickly. We have been trying to, you know, do some of the implementations also here and do some quantizations and play such in games to sort of really actually adapt the architecture to the requirements and also use uh, adaptively the, the amount of hardware we are using and the power consumption and the like. Uh, this is here in the work of one of the <coughs> students that appeared in the actively designed of this, uh, this last year. <coughs> okay, quantum computing, and I'm, I know I'm going very fast, but I'm trying to get you to see all of the range of things, and then uh, yeah, there's a lot more that you can learn in your own. Okay. Uh, quantum computing, there are lots of quantum computers right now out there. So IBM has the IBM Q machine. There's a company called D-Wave. Okay, Google, they have their own thing. So a lot of different, uh, you know, actually uh, vendors, a lot of different uh, leading companies are having their own types of quantum computers. Uh, why quantum computers are very important? Uh, one of the things, for example, that the quantum computer can do uh, is to factor to, to factor actually a very large number. If you factor a very large number, then you are able to break any kind of cipher. So this means that, you know, once you really have a fully functional big enough quantum computer, then actually all of the cryptography would be broken. Okay, so you will be able to, you know, and, and that's why a lot of people are looking at what post quantum computing kind of encoding and cryptography and things of that sort. There are many other, you know, kind of problems that is also solved in a very fast time that nobody else can, can do uh, in that way. They actually are uh, kind of using or leveraging the characteristics of quantum mechanics uh, to, in particular, things, superposition and entanglements, uh, superposition, and, and basically, actually, that, that the core of a quantum computer, so a regular computer would have a representation of the digital bit, okay? If you know that bit, that becomes zero one. But a quantum computer would have something called the qubit. So, and unlike the digital computer, the qubit can be zero and one simultaneously. And there's a probability associated with each one of them. And depending upon the computation, things can settle at one point at the end. You cannot interrupt and read uh, the value of it in the middle. You have to wait until the end. Otherwise, you basically actually like, you know, uh, read everything. Okay? Uh, so, super 
Position you basically just start to add some of those quantum bits, you know, together to be you know, actually like no more uh, of a multiple bit kind of a thing here. But entanglement actually is a very interesting phenomenon that uh, a lot of people uh, would have a, a even a, a difficult time believing. But it is basically actually that if you entangle two two bits, it could be a kilometer away, and then you make a change to one of them, the other one would expose the same change immediately. Okay. So it probably actually would be used more for you know communication and things like that. So it's kind of hard to believe, a little bit crazy, but these are the types of characteristics that people are trying to basically actually sort of, of uh, you know uh, of exploit. Okay. So this is actually some of the things that make them extremely powerful. Uh, again, because of the of the bit being able to be zero and one in the same time, this means that you know. Every uh, kind of a sequence of qubits, okay, would be in two to the n number of k's, okay, simultaneously, and then you could have like two to the n of those. So, so basically, it is it does encode a much larger amount of information than regular kind of, of bit. Uh, you know, uh, so there was uh, a few a uh, couple of months ago, a few months ago, uh, Google came and actually said that. We were able to reach quantum supremacy, and we tried to say that we have a quantum computer right now that can beat, uh, you know, basically actually like regular computers and things of that sort. And, and it turns out, uh, people of course were very skeptical. It turns out that they are trying to really actually have a machine designed for a very specific problem for, you know, done in a very specific way. That's not a general thing at all, okay? And when you speak to people about uh, why aren't you, aren't you there yet, well, you find that people are saying, well, <coughs> the current kind of quantum computers have like about like maybe 50, maybe uh, something like that, you know, quantum bits. And if you really would like to solve the real life problem, you would be looking at like, you know, thousands or something like that of quantum bits that you have in the system, okay? And we still are very far from that point. Uh, you know, there are many other considerations that we can you know, talk about. So anyway, uh, predicting what we're gonna be seeing 10 years from now, it's very hard, okay? I've seen a lot of people predicting technology and field. Again, as I said, in, uh, actually in 1990, was it, no, 2008, uh, people were like kind of smashing their heads. How are we gonna go from the teraflops to the petaflops? And we ended up doing that using a gaming processor, which was actually a processor, which was a processor in the uh, PlayStation and Fine 3, okay? Uh, right now, our, we don't know which direction we're gonna go to. It turns out that each one of those classes of machines that we're looking at in the future excels in a different thing. The quantum computers are based for optimization right now, okay? The, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the neuromorphic are based for optimization, for example. Uh, our regular, you know, kind of computers are still probably the best for regular computation and things like that. So it's really very difficult to see what is gonna happen. The chances are even, uh, you know, I would say five years from now or, or even 10 years from now that we're going to be seeing a lot of big deal, a lot of interest tonight with basically the regular computer side are there, but then assisted by some of those different kinds of technologies. Okay, and then uh, what is going to be after that? Maybe it would be quantum computers, okay, maybe it would be something else, but the chances are that the Glenn is not going to leave us very quickly. It will always be an easy thing to interface with or work with, and all of these other types probably will be uh, kind of niche accelerators, if you will, for some time. And I can stop here and if you have any questions. <coughs> questions? Yes, uh, I would want, uh, I would uh, want you to take back to the starting of the lecture where you said that. Uh, Transistors cannot be made uh, less than se 7 nanometers. Why it is so that uh, it cannot be made smaller than 7 nanometers and uh, what, is, what other engineering engineers and uh, scientists are uh, doing to make it uh, smaller? Oh, okay, so, so there are two things actually. So there are things like, again, uh, the fact that there are some leakages and things like that as you make it smaller, it dissipates more and more power. So, so the leakage current and things like that creates a lot of, of that. And, and uh, uh, so because of that, it's very difficult to make them smaller. Of course, we're going to be getting also hitting physical limits of really getting uh, the transistor to be just a few 
So there are physical limits from the power dissipation, uh, from the torque dissipation side, and there will be also some from actually like, you know, how small <coughs> you are able to work out these things. So these are the two limits that we have. Okay. So these are the easy ones. Okay? But basically, um, you, there will be some attempts to make them smaller, and there will be some bricks, and they are getting smaller, and there's one now that's actually like about <coughs> five nanometers, okay? And uh, are we going to get it smaller than that? We might be able to have another one or two more generations. But we're getting very close to that. You know, being, being Any other questions? So the number of cores we have is like Right, but this is not just an attempt. Yeah, that's not a chip. You know, that really would be like, you know, probably thousands of chips. You know, so, so, uh, uh, so I, I have, you know, pictures of those I should probably show them. But, you know, it's like little thing number three, which is the number one in the world on in China. In China, like a few years ago. Uh, and that, you know, that takes like a huge pull. <coughs> yeah, so there are basically chassis, you know, uh, work together. Because of the, the communication is on overhead. Okay? So that's an excellent question. So the communication is definitely on more overhead. So um, because of that, sometimes when we are in trouble, like for example in, in the early uh, 2000s, okay, uh, Japanese had actually the top circuit here in the world. That was called the FCD. Okay, and it was like mid not a very large number of, of computers, but it was, each one of them was very expensive big processor <coughs> that NEC had done. So IBM wanted to be that. So what IBM did was lowering the frequency to make it cooler, and then he started to do the multi -core. Okay? Um, but, 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 but anyway, but, but I think, so the communication, you know, was actually was, was for example, is still, so I'm, I'm sorry, so, so in order to make this possible, to make it actually kind of, um, more efficient and be able to put more and things of that sort, you lower the frequency of the resistor, you know, from like one and a half or two, like, you know, gigahertz, like 750 megahertz. And, and for them, it didn't impact the overall performance because still the speed of the communication is slow. You know what I mean? Things of that sort. So right now, we try to very much rely on locality. We find that programming style. Uh, are trying to give you a field of locality and programmers try to keep the data as close as possible with the processors. We are trying to add things like, you know, hard DNA, you know, the, the most diagonally access. So we are trying to do a lot of things <coughs> besides just actually having only one more thing. But communication definitely is a problem. Good question. Any other? Yes. And there is a project of Elon Musk that is Right. There is a project of Elon Musk, Neuralink. Neuralink project. Elon Musk. So, sir, is that related to neuromorphic computing? The way he said? Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Yes. Oh, the, yeah, so a lot of, okay, so that's not the main one part here, and this is really becoming very confusing. So, not only actually Elon Musk, I was actually like, you know, talking to some of the people uh, from Facebook, and we hired a bunch of architects. They are trying to develop their own uh, artificial, you know, kind of, or, or like a, a neuromorphic type of, of processor. So, so uh, you know, AI and machine learning style of coprocessors and processors are becoming like Google has something called TP for the tensor processing. I don't know if you've heard of that. Right? Uh, that's only dedicated for AI and things like that. Okay? Uh, which is really making things a little bit uh, difficult because we. Uh, uh, you guys are young, but actually, like, you know, about a long time ago, there was, like, you know, a bunch of companies creating computers. It was not only Intel making processors. Intel was making processors, Motorola was making processors, there's a company called Digital was making processors, Sun was making smart processors, Silicon Graphics was making, actually, like, you know, uh, risk processors, things like that. And the world was very difficult because software having a difficult time running the world these platforms. Very, very difficult to make it portable across all of them. And, uh, and my concern right now is that you know everybody developing primary processors 